Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in here today with me. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube for the video version as well and you're not going to want to miss that. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the brutal murder of Holly Maddox and what ultimately led Ira Einhorn to be labeled the unicorn killer. It is a crazy, crazy solved case that we have for today, and I cannot wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Helen Maddox, who went by the name Holly, was born on May 26th, 1947 to her parents, Fred and Helen. Holly was from a town called Tyler, Texas, and Tyler is definitely your more traditionally conservative town. Her mom was a stay-at-home mother while Fred worked as an engineer and was also a World War II veteran. Holly was the firstborn and the eldest of five. She had three younger sisters as well as a younger brother, and she's described by her siblings as someone who is loving and caring and generous and the type of person that would give you the shirt off of their back if you needed it. And something else about Holly is that she was absolutely stunning. If you're watching me on YouTube, you can tell just by the pictures, she is gorgeous. People actually described her as ethereal and mesmerizing. So if that's not like the two best compliments you could ever get when it comes to your looks, I'm not really sure what is. But even regardless of her looks, she was not vain or egotistical. She was a very well-rounded girl and growing up in school, she loved to dance and art and she was also a cheerleader in school and she actually got the superlative of most likely to be successful, which just is a testament to her and who she was as a person. Now, when it came to growing up and living in the small town of Tyler, Texas, Holly knew that after high school, she wanted something different. She wanted to go to a bigger city. She wanted just a different experience. She lived in Tyler her entire life. So after she graduated high school, she ended up enrolling at Bryn Mawr College, which is located just 14 miles outside of Philadelphia in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. She ended up graduating from college in 1971 with a degree in English. However, once she graduated, Holly dealt with the struggle that a lot of people deal with, which was not knowing exactly what she wanted to do as far as her career after she graduated. She felt a little lost. She felt like she didn't have a lot of direction. So once she graduated college, she didn't go in and start, you know, a job or a career right away. She did have a couple odd jobs here and there trying to figure out, you know, what that next step was going to be for her. Now, just one year after Holly graduated college, Holly would end up meeting the man who would later on become her boyfriend. While sitting at a restaurant, Holly was approached by a man named Ira Einhorn. Ira was seven years older than Holly and was born on May 15th, 1940 in Philadelphia. Ira was the oldest of two sons and his father worked as a car salesman while his mother was also a stay-at-home mom. His family was described as a very typical normal family. Ira graduated high school in 1957 and went on to attend the University of Pennsylvania where he also graduated with a degree in English in 1961. So that is something that him and Holly had in common. They both graduated with an English degree. Now, while Ira was at college, he was a part of several different groups, as well as several anti-war movement groups, anti-establishment. Now, if you are unaware with what anti-establishment is, from my understanding, it's basically the belief that goes in opposition of what the mainstream society believes. So you're kind of going against what the social, economical, and political norms are. Now, a fun fact about Ira is that he was actually a speaker at the first ever Earth Day event in Philadelphia in the 1970s. And there's been a lot of controversy around whether or not Ira was a co-founder in Earth Day, like just Earth Day in and of itself. However, that is not exactly accurate and I'll explain why. So Ira was a speaker at this event, at the Earth Day event in the 1970s. It was the first ever Earth Day event in Philadelphia specifically. And Ira claims that he was a lot more involved in this event than he actually was. Ira has said that this event would not have been possible 
possible had it not been from him. However, the other organizers completely disagree with that statement and say that he was not as involved as he claims that he was and the event was going to go on with or without Ira. He did not create this event in any way. He was simply a speaker there. Now, Ira did work as an English teacher at Temple University. He only worked there for one year in 1964, and it was said that part of that reason that his contract was not renewed is because he spent a lot of time in the classroom preaching to his students about the use of LSD and about weed, and while that might not seem like a crazy big deal, to us now, you have to remember this was the 1960s when, you know, the talk of that was very taboo and it wasn't as socially accepted as it is today. And I'm not talking about LSD, I'm talking about weed because he was also preaching about that and talking to his students about the ways to use it and the benefits from it. So he was doing that. And once the school heard about that, they were completely mortified and they fired him immediately after his one-year contract was over. And if you think that maybe that the school is being a little too harsh, there was actually an instance where Ira stripped down from all of his clothes, so got completely naked and started pulling out joints in his classroom and passing them out to the students. So that could potentially be part of the reason he wasn't hired back. Now, after being let go from Temple University, he went on to teach at the Harvard Institute of Politics in 1978, which was just a couple years after he met Holly. Now, Ira was clearly very smart. No one would ever argue that. And along with that, another word that people liked to use when describing him was charming. However, after doing all of my research, I think that word charming is used very lightly, and I think the better word for it is manipulation. Ira was very manipulative and he was very smart. He was a con man. He never had a lot of money. However, he somehow always was ended up hanging out with the people that did. He hung out with very, very successful business people and would convince them to pay for his, you know, meals or drinks or adventures or things like that. He was always getting other people to pay for him and he always put himself in a position where he was surrounded by very influential and powerful people and would try to become their best friend and really charm them in whatever way possible in order to do that. Just an example of one of his friends, if you guys are familiar with the band The Grateful Dead, the guitarist in that band named Jerry Garcia was actually one of Ira's friends. So that's the kind of affluent people that I am talking about, the kind of success that I'm talking about. Ira put himself in front of these people and worked his magic to get them to do what he wanted them to do. Now, Ira has also self-proclaimed to have thousands of lovers. That is his exact wording. And a lot of his friends have agreed with this. He's someone who always had a girl. He always had a girlfriend, someone on his arm. And a lot of his friends credit this to the fact that he always pretended like he was more interested in them than he actually was. Ira would sit down with these girls and ask them their opinions on politics and the environment and all of these different subjects. A lot of these women had never experienced having someone who wanted to know their thoughts or their opinions, as terrible as that sounds. I know it sounds horrible. So then when you have Ira that's asking them these questions, it feels different for them. And it feels like maybe he actually really likes me because he's asking me my opinion. He's asking me what my thoughts are. But in reality, that wasn't really the case for Ira. Obviously, he knew what he was doing. He obviously knew that in asking these questions, it made these women feel like they had an emotional connection to him. However, for Ira, these were just topics that he liked to talk about. Now, Ira and Holly had a lot in common. Like I said, they both got their degree in English. However, they also had a very big dislike for conservatism. And now again, this is the 1960s. So not all of it is the same type of conservatism that we see today, but both were very, very passionate about breaking out of the box of social norms. So Ira actually ended up running for mayor at one point because he was so involved in environmentalism and was an activist. And he had all these ideas and opinions on what he wanted to to do. However, obviously he did not become mayor. Something else that Ira did is he really did place himself on this pedestal. He thought that he was better than everyone else for having these different thoughts and ideas and for going on to his own path and for breaking out of this box and all of those words that I keep using. I'm sorry, but those are the best ways that I can describe it. He almost had a sense of I am better than everyone else because of this. He had a superiority complex. Something else that I found weird about Ira is that he never washed his clothes. 
ever. But the reasoning for not washing his clothes is what really got me because he said he was too mystic to bathe. Too mystic to bathe. Whatever that means. So you have Holly's backstory and you have Ira's backstory. So now let's talk about the two of them together. So when Holly and Ira first met, it was ready, set, go. The two of them got together and hit it off immediately, so much so that they ended up moving in together after only two weeks of knowing each other. But this relationship was anything but smooth sailing. Holly and Ira were always breaking up and making up and fighting, and they always had a different issue. And from what I've read about their relationship, I would argue that there was a lot of emotional abuse going on in that relationship or emotional manipulation maybe is the better word to use from Ira's end. Ira would insist on having an open relationship with Holly even though that was not something that she was interested in. Along with that there was a point where Holly even confided in her friend and told her friend that Ira had forced her to have sex with another person while he sat there and watched which is very much illegal, by the way, to force someone to do that without their consent, very much illegal. Holly and Ira would also attend parties together and then Ira would just leave with another woman. So it really was just psychological torture, but Holly saw something in Ira and she loved him. She ended up introducing Ira to her parents and she knew well before she even introduced him to them that her parents were not going to like Ira. She even called her dad beforehand and said, heads up, you're probably not going to like my boyfriend. And according to Holly's sister, Holly was 100% right because her family was not a fan of Ira from the beginning. They thought that he was obnoxious and controlling over Holly. While they were sitting at dinner during their prayer right before they ate, he was sitting there picking scabs off of his skin. I know it's disgusting, but that is what he was doing. And then after dinner, he put his feet up on the table. So just very disrespectful things to do when you're meeting your girlfriend's family for the first time. Now this on again, off again relationship lasted for about five years. Like I said, there was just something that Holly could not let go of when it came to Ira. However, the two spent their last vacation together in the late summer of 1977 when they traveled to London together. Now the two of them were not there alone. Holly's sister actually accompanied them on the trip and the trip was paid for by Holly from the money that she had saved up. Now, while they were all in London together, Holly was just hit with the reality that this relationship with Ira was not going to last long and she knew that it was just time to end it. So she ended up confiding in her sister and told her sister that once the two of them got back to the United States together, Holly's plan was to break up with Ira. However, this plan ended up changing when Holly couldn't even wait to get back to the United States. She ended up leaving Ira in London by himself and traveled back to the United States with her sister, breaking up with him in London. When she got back to the States, she ended up renting an apartment in New York and she chopped her hair off. She was starting a new chapter and she had retrieved some of her belongings from the apartment that she had lived in with Ira. However, some of her belongings were still there. Now, very soon after she rented this new apartment, Holly actually ended up meeting a new guy named Saul Lapidus. And I probably am butchering that pronunciation on some level. However, when Holly met Saul, she was head over heels for this guy. And the two of them hit it off very well. They ended up meeting at a dinner party for a mutual friend. And after the dinner party, they just hung out together and talked for hours. They ended up spending the next three to four weeks together. They were inseparable. And according to Saul, hanging out with Holly was just magical. However, for Ira being the control freak that he was, he was not happy about this whatsoever. When he got back to Philadelphia and realized that Holly was really gone for good and that she had moved on, he about lost it. So this all leads us to September 9th, 1979. And on this particular day, Holly was actually on Saul's boat with him. And the two of them were actually planning on going on this like two week boating adventure. However, while they were preparing, Holly ended up getting a call from Ira. And when she answered the phone, Ira was very frantic. He was very hysterical and he was very upset. And he told Holly that he had gathered up all of the other belongings that Holly had left at his 
his apartment and that she needed to come and pick them up right away right now or else he was going to throw her belongings in the middle of the street now holly did not want to go at all holly did not want to go over to that apartment she started calling some of her friends to see if they could go over there however none of her friends were able to go and so ultimately she knew that she had to go get her stuff now saul did not like the idea of holly going over there by herself so he offered to go with her however holly told him that it was fine he didn't need to go she could handle it on her own and that she knows how to handle when he gets into these moods is kind of the gist that he had told her so holly then told saul that she was just going to go get her belongings and then she would meet him back on the boat later that night however that would be the last time saul would ever see holly now now, after September 9th, no one had seen or heard from Holly. Saul was trying to contact her, trying to call her. He was receiving nothing on his end and neither was her family. And it wasn't until about a month after she had gone missing on September 9th that her family finally knew that something was wrong because her mother's birthday was in early October and no one had heard from Holly on her mother's birthday. And everyone knew that there was no way that Holly would have just, you know, not called her mom on her birthday or not sent her mom a card. Her family then decided to call Ira and asked if he had heard from Holly at all. And that's when Ira kind of gave some half-ass story about it. He said he hadn't heard from Holly in a while, but last he heard, she was going and planning on traveling the world by herself. Now, obviously when Holly's family heard this, they knew that their daughter would not just up and travel the world by herself without telling anyone. So her family got increasingly more worried. And that is when they reached out to the Philadelphia Police Department to file a missing persons report. Now, when the police got word of this, they obviously were a little suspicious of Ira. However, Ira had such a great reputation for some reason. Everyone liked this guy. And so police weren't too concerned about him. They thought, you know, yeah, it's a little weird, but they weren't suspicious enough to really take a lot of action towards figuring out if he did have something to do with this. They had no evidence to go off of other than he was the last known person to see Holly, which typically in other cases that we have seen, that does mean a lot. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you tend to find something, but for police, they just, they said that they had no evidence. And so they couldn't really do anything about it. So this was driving Holly's family crazy. As you can imagine. So they actually ended up bringing in two private detectives, one from Tyler, Texas, and one from Philadelphia. Now these PIs were actually able to uncover some pretty telling information. What they learned is that the night that Holly went missing on September 9th, the man who lived directly below Ira and Holly's apartment was a man named Paul. And on the night of September 9th, Paul remembers hearing a lot of loud banging coming from the upstairs apartment, as well as a woman screaming. However, he just figured that they were having a party or they were having people over, so he didn't really think much of it. However, Paul said that his mindset changed when a few days later, a brown liquid began leaking in from his ceiling. Paul was not sure what this liquid was, so he called his landlord who hired a roofer, and the roofer blamed it on a potential dead animal and the roofer actually isolated the source of the leak and the smell because it was smelling too. He isolated the source of all of this to be the back closet of Ira's apartment. So the roofer goes upstairs to Ira's apartment, knocks on the door and asks to see the closet in the back. However, Ira refuses to let them into the apartment. And when they ask about the closet, he says, oh, there's just a giant padlock on that closet and I don't have the key, so I don't know where it is. So ultimately the roofer and the landlord, they have have to leave because Ira's not letting them in. So they leave and that was kind of the end of that, weirdly enough. However, the PIs also got a piece of information from a bookstore employee who said that Ira had come in shortly after Holly's disappearance and had asked for a book specifically on the process of mummification. However, the bookstore didn't carry the book that Ira was looking for, so he ultimately left. 
So now we're in early 1979. So this is well over a year after Holly went missing and the private detectives handed over all of the information that they had collected to the police after spending so much time doing all of their research and collecting evidence. And when police looked at this, they literally said that it read like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. That was the direct quote. So because of all of this, the police were able to obtain a search warrant. And on March 28th, 1979, the police knocked on Ira Einhorn's door. Before we move any further, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors for today's video. Have you guys ever had that moment where you realize it's time to find a new place to live? Well, at apartments.com, they call it an out of apartment experience. Maybe you're lugging the trash bag down a six floor walk up when it bursts open right as you reach the dumpster, or it could strike you the second that you realize the change machine at the laundromat is broken. Or maybe it hits you when you receive some life altering news, like finding out you're going to be a parent. The first thing to do after an out of apartment experience is to start your search for a new place on apartments.com. They've helped millions of renters find their perfect place to live, whether it's an apartment, townhome, condo, or even a house. And with their 3D virtual tours, you can scour every inch of a listing because sometimes two dimensions aren't enough. The features don't end there. Apartments.com also has powerful search tools to help you find a place that meets all of your requirements. So when you're having one of those out of apartment experiences, take a moment and check out apartments.com, the place to find a place. So police walk up to the door, they knock on the door, and before they even get into the apartment, they said that they recognized the smell of a decomposing body. Now, when Ira opened the door, they presented him the search warrant and they went directly to that back closet in the back of Ira's apartment. Now, again, this closet had a giant padlock on it and police asked Ira if he had the key to the lock, which Ira said he did not, which by the way was a lie. The key was hanging up in the hallway. However, Ira told police that he did not have the key. And that is when police brought out a crowbar to ultimately unlock that lock. And when they got inside of that closet, they found multiple boxes containing Holly's personal items, like her purse, her driver's license, and her library card. However, it did not take police long to find the giant steamer trunk in the closet as well. Now, when looking at this trunk, it looked like it had retained damage from some sort of liquid and it also had another lock on it. So police then turned to Ira, ask him for the key. He says he doesn't have it. So they bring out the crowbar again and open the trunk. And when police opened the trunk, they found air fresheners, insects, styrofoam, as well as a newspaper from August and September of 1977, around the same time that Holly went missing. However, through all of this rubbish, essentially, there was a human hand poking out. When police uncovered the human hand, it then led them to the rest of the body in the trunk, and the body itself had actually been mummified from the heat. Now, when police discovered the body, they knew right then and there that they had just found Holly Maddox trapped in a trunk just several feet away from Ira's bed. Now, when police looked at him after finding the body, Ira just said, you found what you found. Now, the medical examiner was called and Holly's body was removed from Ira's apartment in the trunk. An autopsy was done and it revealed that Holly had been killed from head trauma. She had six fractures to her face, forehead, eye sockets, and jaw, all resulting by being hit with a heavy object with great force. Ira was then arrested and then charged with first degree murder. Now, what's interesting is that after Ira's arrest, the, you know, amazing reputation that Ira had that really kept police police from looking into him in the first place started to crumble. And obviously not because he just got arrested for first degree murder, but because people started to say what they really felt about Ira. Friends started coming forward and said that they felt like Ira was a manipulative, selfish con man. Two of his ex-girlfriends actually came forward and said that Ira had attacked them after they had threatened to leave him. 
two of Iris' friends also remember him asking them to help him get rid of the trunk that was ultimately hiding Holly's body. However, they were busy or they couldn't help move the trunk. So Iris' attempt was unsuccessful. Now, Iris' lawyer ended up negotiating bail of $40,000, which would have been equivalent to about $388,000 today. Ira was able to make bail and he ended up being released from custody. Now, just days before Ira's trial in 1981, he ended up fleeing to Europe. So this just completely turned everything upside down. He fled to Europe and stayed there, forget this, 17 years. Yes, 17 years. He married a Swedish woman named Annika and was living life under the name of Eugene Malin. He ended up telling Annika his real name, but painted the picture that he was being convicted of a crime he did not commit. Now, the two of them were constantly moving around, trying to make it more difficult for police to find him. And he just ended up living carefree for 17 years before he ultimately ended up getting arrested in France in 1997 after Annika had submitted a driver's license application under the name of Annika Floden Malin. And that was the last name that Ira was using as an alias name. And that set off record checks because police knew that that was his alias. So now you think that Ira is arrested, case closed, right? No. Not yet. So France and the US have an extradition treaty, which basically says that either country can refuse to extradite a person based off of certain circumstances. Now, one of those circumstances was the death penalty. So France, along with many other places in the world, they abolish the death penalty. They do not believe in it. They do not have it. However, here in the US, we do have the death penalty. And France does not extradite people back to the US if it is possible that they will receive the death penalty. So obviously the U.S. is getting fed up with this. They just, you know, this guy has been missing for 17 years. They just found him and now France isn't giving him back. It's just one thing after another. So because of this, that's when a law was passed in Pennsylvania in 1992 called the Einhorn Law. And that law basically makes it legal to try a suspect in trial without them there and for them to be charged for a crime. So obviously this really helped the prosecution in this situation. So Ira was going to be put on trial, even though he physically was not going to be there. However, after all of this commotion and all of these problems and all of these roadblocks, on July 20th, 2001, Ira was extradited back to the United States finally. Now at the trial, he took the stand in his own defense and said that Holly was murdered by the CIA and that the CIA was blaming Ira and trying to frame him due to his conspiracy investigations. And he also tried to claim that he did not know that Holly's body was in his apartment, which just again, makes no sense. That's just not real. That's not true. And so despite his defense, the jury deliberated for about two hours before he was found guilty on October 18th, 2002 for the murder of Holly Maddox, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So he did not get the death penalty for this. However, Ira Einhorn did pass away on April 3rd, 2020, so just about two years ago, from cardiac problems in prison at the age of 79. So that is the murder of Holly Maddox in the case of Ira Einhorn. And you might be wondering why Ira was named the unicorn killer. Well, that is because Ira kind of gave this name to himself in the 60s and 70s, Ira called himself a unicorn, and that was because the English translation of his last name is unicorn. So Ira would go around and tell people that he was a unicorn, and he would call himself a unicorn. So that is why he was named the unicorn killer. So that is the case today, you guys. I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this one. If you have any comments on it, I would love to know. Again, like I said, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube as well and you're not going to want to miss it. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys and until then, stay safe. Bye guys.